Have a sandwich, but not a fragments of silicon sandwich. Welcome to another installment of the Fragments of Silicon Daylight Interviews. Joining us this week is Renee Gittens of Stumbling Cat. Pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to have you. Right, so let's get into things. We like to start by getting to know the people behind the games, the studios, and all of that business. And we do this by asking this question. What got you interested in video games, both on a personal and a professional level? Oh, so um, growing up, my father actually was playing first-person shooters, and that was my first exposure to video games quite early. So around the age of four or five. Um, so I watched him both by pulling a chair up to his desk and watching him play on PC. Uh, and then I started playing myself around like five or six. Uh, so my first games in order were actually uh, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Duke Nukem 3D, and then Pokemon Yellow. Um, but the, the game that truly changed my view of video games was the original Half-Life. Um, it just completely changed my idea of what games could be. Mm, I, that was uh, the reaction to a lot of people to Half-Life back in the day. Yeah, it's just so well done. It, it's so immersive, like the, the scripted events, the storytelling, you know, doing that experiment at the beginning that sort of sets off the whole plot. It's just, and like none of the puzzles in the game feel contrived. They all feel like they are part of the world and, and have a reason for being the way they are. I mean, um, I wouldn't agree with that, but <laughs> oh, certainly, okay. not that, uh, certainly not that one room with the crates hanging and like that never really... Uh, looked plausible to me. I don't know. Like, but call it a difference of opinion. Right. Um, with regards to becoming a professional game developer, I actually didn't know that was a potential path for me until I met some uh, professional game developers my senior year of college. Uh, so I was quite late to realizing I could be a developer, um, but I changed my whole career path from that point forward. Is it one of those white people get paid for this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I didn't actually know the process of game development. Uh, games Fair. were something I played, but I didn't really know how they were made. Um, and upon seeing the people who made them and learning more about game development, I was like, wait, I love all of these things. Damn it, I could have been a game developer. Why did I get an engineering degree instead of a CS degree? Um, but, you know, I, I taught myself programming and started the path uh, as much as I could. Um, I actually started my career in biotech, but then I, I switched over to software development um, and uh, eventually game development. And where did you end up uh, in the industry? Um, I've, I've been in all sorts of roles um, within the game development industry. Currently, I run my own small indie studio called Stumbling Cat. And of course, we just released Potions, A Curious Tale. Prior to that, um, I've been in executive management for a while. Uh, so I was the general manager of Phoenix Labs Vancouver, creators of Dauntless and Fay Farm. And prior to that, I was the executive director of the International Game Developers Association, which is the largest nonprofit uh, association supporting game developers around the world. Um, my career path has been mostly in uh, technical production. So being the producer or project manager for engineering teams. Uh, but I've done everything from being the marketing coordinator for Xbox Games with Gold to being a solutions architect for an AI middleware company. Hmm. Wow, you, you certainly run a gamut of positions. <laughs> I'm definitely a, a like jack everybody. or drill of all trades. 
Indeed. And I suppose the most pertinent question relevant to the discussion at hand is, what led you to walk the path of the small indie? Yeah, so this is actually a path I've been um, walking almost throughout my entire game development career. When I was working in biotech, I had started volunteering on the side pro bono for smaller indie studios and got some experience there. But ultimately, when I left biotech, uh, the majority of my experience was as uh, an industrial design and system and design engineer with a bit of software development. Uh, And it was very difficult for me to compete with CS students out of college for positions. And I was also looking to figure out what I wanted to do within the games industry. I figured I could be a producer, a engineer, or potentially a game designer. Um, but I hadn't spent too much time designing my own games. I had designed some board games and such, but but never a video game. Uh, I know that in um, the games industry, it's extremely important to have a portfolio. So I figured I could study game design a bit and work on a portfolio piece. And so the, the title I developed for that was called Potions. Um, and there was just so much more interest in it than I expected that I decided to take it on as a, as a proper project and uh, aim to release a commercial product from my development of it. And that just took a very long time because uh, it ultimately ended up being sort of a a very, very long-term side project. Indeed. um, I think Potions has been kicking around for at least a decade. Almost. Yeah, it's it's been about nine and a half years. Wow. That that is certainly a long time to have something percolating. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I definitely don't want to cut any corners. So it was a, a massive development process. Um, and then, you know, I, I really learned so much throughout my career when creating it. Um, and so, you know, I think that the game has improved greatly over time, too. So I'm really I'm really proud of where it is. And of course, it's been um, quite well received by by our audience. Um, but having that pressure of having a side project always means like it's hard to enjoy your weekends and any downtime. Um, I pretty much dropped almost all of my hobbies because there was just this sense of guilt that if I had any spare time, I should be working on potions. Mm. And at what point did this jump from side project to full-time affair? I only left um, full-time game development last year. Um, I I left in February last year, uh, but I didn't really start full-time until May. I was had to move countries and I had um, some conferences to attend. So I I started full-time on potions in May of last year and then shipped it, of course, in March of this year. Hmm. And what was the impetus behind that you know what was the the thing that made you say finally say i'm going to sit down and complete this uh it was a combination of things um first of which is it was nearing completion so i could tell that there was sort of the final push that was left um secondly it was because i was able to save up enough money to um you know hire a a full-time artist to help with the final art assets um you know, prior to that, I was only going off of some Kickstarter funds I had, and I wasn't able to afford to bring anyone on um, full time. But uh, since I had been working full time in the games industry and, and living below my means, um, when I left my job last year, I actually had enough savings that I, I could invest um, more money into the the game and and help it complete. <laughs> Certainly, a risky po- uh, proposition. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily trying to. I, I my my main hope was to get the money back I had put in, um, but I really just wanted to finish the game to a good quality. Uh, so, you know, even if I had lost that money, I think I would have still seen success in just getting the game out the door. Um, I am glad that I didn't lose that money. Ultimately, um, you know, nobody likes losing losing like tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, but it right. was um, it was just something that I felt like I had to do. And I was kind of treating it like college 2.0. I mean, you know, I, 
at this point, I certainly am considered a game industry uh, expert, veteran, professional, whatever term you'd like to use. Um, but when I started Potions, I, I was not. I was very much a novice. So uh, I recognize that seeing this project through taught me a lot and helped help me get to where I am in my career today. I mean, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, on several levels, you know, especially since, you know, we do have a fair amount of folk who come through these doors whose story, you know, isn't as uh, happy. Yeah. I mean, indie game dev is really hard. Game dev in general is hard. <laughs> it's just... Yes. Um, there, there are so many factors in play, um, and you know, not only is it so subjective, um, but you, you never know. Like somebody might create a game just like yours and release it two months before your planned release date. You know, there's a, a lot of potential I mean, issues to run into. I mean, I have been noticing a prevalence of potion economic simulators out there. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. And it, I mean, obviously, my game's been in development for nine and a half years. There was like nothing similar on the market there uh, at that point in time. There was Reseteer, right. yeah, which I was is about to mention maybe Reseteer, but that's still a little bit off of what I'm seeing, you know, in the trailers here. Yeah, it doesn't have like the witchy theming. Um, yeah. For those of you who are listening and are not familiar, uh, Reseteer, an item shop tale, is a much older um, Japanese game where you play basically as the owner of an item shop in what one could assume is maybe a JRPG or a similar world. Um, and so it's, it's very economic based, though it does have some dungeon diving aspects, um, which was actually my favorite part of the game, which is probably one of the reasons why Potions is so uh, focused on being out in the world. Uh, and I originally had actually considered Potions having a similar uh, day night cycle, a shop cycle, um, being able to take on requests from the villagers. But I decided that what I wanted to prioritize was the adventure, the exploration, and the story. Uh, so I decided to, to cut out the economic aspects in potions. So it's, it's very much an adventure crafting game or even an action adventure game. Yeah. Honestly, potions reminds me a good deal of Rune Factory. I haven't played Rune Factory. It's basically if Harvest Moon, but a lot more combat. Oh, okay. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I mean, I think they're up to, what, six of them now? Like it's really been... Yeah. It, I know it's been around for a while. Yeah. I think I know that... this got one on Switch? There's cool. a few of them on Switch. I know a lot of people but, see similarities between um, Potions and the uh, Atelier series. Um, mm. But that series is, of course, like JRPG-style turn-based combat. Right. Uh, so not yeah. like in-the-world uh, adventure action stuff. Right. And I suppose another question that comes to mind is, why Potions? What was the allure there um, back in the day? Yeah, so I, I wasn't actually leaning on the theming so much as the mechanics. Uh, I had been playing a game called uh, Pixel Dungeon. I don't know if you played it. It's a mobile game. Uh, no. and, <laughs> and it reminded me of, of two frustrations. In Pixel Dungeon, uh, you are dungeon diving, and so your goal is to get down to deeper dungeon levels. But the way the experience works and movement works is... Uh, you need to kill all the monsters on a level in order to get enough experience to kill the boss monsters. And um, if you find the door down to the next level early, it's actually a really bad thing because movement consumes food. And so you might starve to death before you clear the level if you find the exit early. And I thought that that just felt awful. It felt terrible to like discover your goal and that to be a negative thing. So uh, that got me thinking about um, just how we treat experience in games and how heroes are so often um, rewarded for just psychopathically slaughtering every like force creature they see. 
uh, which is not like a super heroic thing to do. Um, and I, I was thinking about how to solve that. And I know some games have used karma systems, but karma systems feel very contrived because yeah. sometimes you do need a rabbit's paw for a quest. But if you don't need a rabbit's paw and you still kill every fluffy bunny, then like you just seem like kind of a bad person. So I, I came up with an idea that combat always had a cost. There's some sort of resource cost uh, to engage in combat. And I, I like high fantasy worlds um, or just at least fantastical worlds. And so it seemed like the best approach for um, creating resource based combat that was fantastical was to use potions uh, because they can have, they can basically be magical spells that you create with ingredients you get in the world. Um, and, and that's why that's the, the whole basis of the potions theming. It was really just a solution to uh, resource um, management combat. It makes sense. And it seems a well enough theme. And, Thank you. you know, give, given all the marketing materials and everything, you, you certainly run with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, once you make that decision, you certainly have to lean into it. Mm, I suppose so. Like, um, so how does the crafting system work exactly? Yeah, so the the crafting system is something, it's one of the few systems I actually rebuilt several times, um, trying to find a, a good solution. Currently, the way that the crafting system works is that you need to combine three ingredients to get a potion. And each of those ingredients is worth um, generally some sort of mana value. Uh, so you might have a feather is worth one air mana, maybe um, like a crystal is worth one fire, one earth mana. Um, and the most amount of mana a um, ingredient can contribute is two. So that might be two of the same type of mana or two different types of mana. And then uh, mana combinations are what relate directly to um, recipes. In general, uh, you shouldn't be combining more than two types of mana. There's a few recipes that allow for that, but 95% of them uh, only work with two mana combinations. Uh, and that's just to keep the number of potential recipes down. So every <laughs> single every single two mana combination, so if you have like three fire or two water or two air, um, two earth, that's always going to result successfully in a potion. Uh, and if I had done three, like, then I would be doing like a thousand unique potions. <laughs> You'd which still is work just... on it to this day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I felt like the two mana combinations was a, a pretty solid place to, to cut the line there. Um, now, there are some unique recipes that require specific ingredients. Um, for example, if you use three blueberries, uh, you can make blue dye um, instead of the three water mana that they contribute, which would normally be a um, small water bomb. Hmm. Like, and so what were some of the previous attempts at building a potion system? Yeah, I had originally started with a um, three specific ingredients are required for every potion, but it made experimenting very frustrating and, and nearly impossible. My goal with that was to have the NPCs um, continuously provide written hints towards how you could um, make new potions. But as I was playtesting, and of course playtesting is, is so important in development, I noticed that if someone tried to experiment with creating a new potion and they failed, uh, even just once, they would immediately stop experimenting and never try again. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you pretty much couldn't fail. And every single combination of one mana ingredients always succeeds. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that if people were using like new ingredients, uh, at least the base level ingredients, they would never run into failure. Um, and that certainly has encouraged people to experiment more. I can see the logic in that. Am I like, and I'd imagine that there are some games out there that it would not be so lenient. Yeah. 
I, I certainly haven't wanted people to feel like they needed to rely on an online guide. <laughs> um, it, it is, though, uh, kind of crazy to me that there are multiple online guides for potions now. I, I thought if I thought I would have to make my own if I wanted them to exist, um, but several people have actually created full game guides for the game now. I'm, I'm very... Uh, that's one of the things I certainly didn't expect. That is a sign of success, I find. Like, <laughs> cool. you know, if people are making guides of your game, that means they're playing it. <laughs> Yeah. Other people are also playing it and might be getting stuck somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, believe me, I, I, we've encountered uh, games um, for like review or what have you on this program that don't have guides. And have like, been so obtuse, we've ended up dropping them fairly early on. Uh, like, so, you can understand the concern there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Plus, getting something that you really want is different than just having it not fail. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and, and that's the the other um, thing that I, I did. Uh, I wrote out basically a list of rules that I use personally. Um, so it you know combinations always sort of make sense. So you know if you combine like equal amounts. Um, fire and earth. I'm, I'm not sure this is correct, but I think it just always results in lava. So whether it's one and one, two and two, three and, or three, and three, it's always going to create some type of lava potion. Hmm. Now, I suppose that does beg the question, is there any chance to fail on some of the more complicated, uh, specialized potions? Uh, so there's no chance of failing crafting itself if you're using the correct uh, ingredients or mana. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the recipe is guaranteed to succeed if, if you're using the, the correct combination. Um, however, because of the way that uh, the mana combinations work, if you just like start throwing in high level ingredients, you're going to be getting four different types of mana. And that's always, uh, I was going to say that's always going to fail. That's always going to fail except for some very explicit, unique recipes, um, such as the cure-all potion. Hmm. Let me see. Um, and do the proportions of each ingredient matter at all? Like, you know, you have to have, like, three blueberries or two water, um, you mentioned. Yeah, so if you use, like, three water mana and one earth mana, that's going to get a different potion than two water mana and one earth mana. Okay. Well, once again, that makes sense. Uh, and what sorts of potions can you create? I mean, I'm imagining some of the staples here, like healing potions, strength potions, fireproofing potions, whatnot? Yeah. Um, so we have fire resistance potions. We have healing potions. We don't have strength potions, um, but we have things that sort of uh, have similar effects. Uh, so earth potions, for example, can help you push heavy objects. They just push the heavy object themselves versus empowering the player to push the heavy objects. Um, the, like, and also each type of potions or each type of el element uh, potion that you can create has a different effect. So uh, lava and fire potions can burn down um, obstacles that are burnable, like um, dead trees, uh, and they can melt ice. Um, you know, wind potions can blow things back uh, or, or push objects, just like rock potions can push things back or, or knock things up. Um, and shatter things. So if you have like a, a fragile rock in your way, you can shatter it with an explosive potion or a rock potion. Uh, the, the sort of potion types that there are, um, there's a bunch of mana types, um, naming quickly off my head, you know, there's obviously water, earth, uh, wind, fire. There's also like vine, um, metal, lava, ice, Lightning, storm, sand, like dust, storm sort of things. 
Um, and then there's uh, self-empowerment potions, which are mostly resist potions, damage resist potions. So you have resistance to all the major four elements, as well as um, normal damage resist and a complete immunity potion. Um, and then there's uh, an, like another type of self buff potion, which is potions of speed, which allow you to zip around the map when you're walking. Um, you have to dismount to collect ingredients. So if you want to just really quickly c- collect ingredients, it's best to instead consume a potion of speed and then zip around uh, collecting everything because you don't have to mount and dismount. Hmm. Are there teleportation po- potions, like fast travel potions? No, you get a stone of recall, um, which can take you home anytime you use it. And then when you mm-hmm. return back to the world, um, you can select loading into the start of any uh, level or sub-level. Hmm. Okay. And do you need to engage the uh, potion system in order to complete the game. Absolutely. Yeah. So you don't actually need to engage in very much combat in order to complete the game. You can play the game really passively. Um, okay. You'll still need to defeat creatures, uh, but you can use hazards in the world. In fact, you can defeat almost every single boss monster without directly attacking it. <laughs> um, they all have sort of alternative mechanics to defeat them. You can use the environment against them. And I and guess the game... that's also for, like, if you run out of potions, you're not entirely screwed. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to make it n- not punishing <laughs> if you if you find yourself in, like, a really long fight, for example. There's there's still a chance to win. Well, um, it's, uh, it's also, that's a good way to get yourself soft law. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, you, you do have your teleport home, um, so you, you can always uh, run away if, if a boss fight feels too overwhelming. Um, mm. and, and speaking of things being overwhelming, since some of my players are younger or less experienced with games, there's actually a complete um, invulnerability setting in the menu. So you can just play with invulnerability on and then not stress about damage. Um, I've seen a lot of, like, seven, eight-year-old girls play the game and, you know, try to figure out working with a controller or keyboard and mouse for the first time. And uh, I think turning on invulnerability for them just makes the experience less frustrating. Right. (laughs) That does make sense. You know, that that's one of those modern accessibility options. Like I think uh, psychonauts two had that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Like anyway, so are there any sort of RPG elements? Like, do you gain levels here? No. Um, I wanted to make sure there wasn't a focus on defeating monsters for any type of progress other than maybe getting some ingredients you want. So um, there's there's no experience, and um, your progress is really gated by the potions that you learn. Uh, the way that I have set up the game, however, is that you're always given a recipe for the potions you need. You just can advance certain areas earlier if you discover um, potions uh, to to get rid of blockers. So, so kind of like Legend of Zelda style, where if you know what you're doing, you can go defeat the fifth dungeon first, or something like that. Not, yeah, very similar to that. Um, I do sort of have hard progression locks on the dungeons just because of... Um, my game is much more story focused than the Legend of Zelda games, and so there needs to be a little bit of order to some of the progression just Fair. for the story to make sense. Understandable. But you can yeah. certainly get to like um, secrets, unlocks, permanent health increases, and things like that by knowing potions before um, you are given certain recipes. And I think you're only given like six or seven recipes in the game, and there's 107 po- recipes that you can learn. But I'm guessing it's like six or seven, or like what you need to beat the game, and anything else is just, oh, hey, I found out something cool. Yep, exactly. Uh, you'd certainly need to learn more recipes to 100% the game. So you need to learn all the recipes to 100% the game. Um, but yeah, you can beat the storyline just with the uh, recipes that you're given. 
I suppose that uh, does beg the question: What does an hundred uh, percent in the game entail? Like, what uh, what sort of optional subquests or collectibles are available? Yeah. Um, so there are four or five recruitable NPCs um, that give mini quests in the game. So uh, going out and finding them and doing their recruitment quests uh, is required to hundred percent the game. There's also uh, 56 collectible cards in the game that are all hidden in different secret areas with different puzzles. Uh, So you need to solve all those puzzles to get the the collectible cards. And those uh, cards unlock gates um, behind which there are often permanent health increases and other benefits. Um, Mm. There's learning all 107 recipes, of course. yeah, and then like there's a lot of focus on the puzzles. If you collect all the cards, you solve all the puzzles, but um, there's some special uh, achievements for some of the more difficult puzzles. Hmm. And what sort of puzzles have you cooked up for your game here? Oh, there's all different types. I had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> You know, when I was originally creating the game, I definitely wanted some level of in-world puzzles. But as I was developing it, um, I added so many more. I think there's 60 plus puzzles in the game. And some of them are as simplistic as there is a burnable bush and you need to burn it in order to get to a treasure chest behind it. Um, But there are a lot more complex ones. Um, There are ones that are ice sliding puzzles and block pushing puzzles. And there are sort of like number logic puzzles where you're you're dealing with um, rotating tiles. You have to figure out how to rotate them to to get them in order and open locked doors. Um, There are also really like hint based puzzles. So NPCs will tell you about a problem without directly telling you the solution. And you just sort of put together what the solution might be between a bunch of different hints and clues. Uh, And then there's also a lot that do a combination of mechanics. It's like, ah, I need to use this mechanic to get access to this other mechanic and then, you know, push a block and that block blocks a different mechanic that then allows me to engage with this thing and, um, you know, successfully uh, get to the treasure at the end. Um, So all sorts of, all sorts of different things like that. Well, it's good that you had fun um, making the brain teasers of the game. Yeah, and and I think that's actually one of the the things that people enjoy most is that because there isn't like a super heavy intense combat focus, where the player feels the most reward uh, is by being using their own problem solving ability in the game. Uh, so it it's very self-empowering. It makes you feel successful when you figure out, oh man, I bet I can do this. And then it turns out to be the, the actual uh, answer. Oh, and then um, one last mechanic I didn't talk about that's actually super important to the game feel mm-hmm. is that uh, many of the best ingredients you can't get from killing monsters directly. You need to get... Uh, those ingredients from the monsters by engaging with them in a special manner, whether that's using a potion of a certain element on them or chasing them or getting them to fall into a certain type of trap. Um, There's a whole bestiary with like these observations and and ways to unlock the uh, two mana ingredients for the most part. So most of the higher mana um, ingredients come from these unique uh, interactions with creatures. A regular potion pedia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Potion decks. <laughs> anyway, um, so I suppose this is a good uh, time to talk about the stories, um, since we haven't really focused on that yet. You know, it's like, you know, like, who is this purple witch? Um, why is she so engaged in potions and all of those questions. Okay, yeah. I'm properly back now. All right. 
So um, the main character of the game is named Luna. Um, she is a 12 year old witch uh, who has just accidentally blown the back porch off of her mother's house. Um, As one her does. mother, <laughs> yeah, her her mother is not talented in magic, but her grandmother is, and um, un- unknown to to Luna, she had the similar talents as her grandmother. And while she was trying to repair a scuff in a door, uh, she accidentally combined the ingredients for a small explosive potion, uh, and instead blew the door and the back porch of her house away. Uh, her mother decided that. It was a little risky not having her um, properly trained, considering her talents and abilities. So she sent her off to study under her grandmother, who lives in Old Haven, uh, which is on the edge of the wildlands next to the deep, dark forest. Uh, It's a port town that's really for adventurers and explorers um, very far away from the rest of civilization. So uh, Luna has a bit of a tumultuous journey there that is actually part of the tutorial of the game. And where you you quickly run into the first boss fight. Um, But once she starts studying under her grandmother, um, she maybe sets off a chain of events that might destroy the world and then um, goes goes about fixing them. Uh, Along her way, uh, she meets characters from fairy tale and folklore from across the world and um, really gets to engage in sort of her own coming of age story, um, finding that, you know, authority is not always right, that looks can be deceiving and that it always helps to have a little bit of empathy. Um, and so the, the story itself has uh, a lot of meaning and depth, but it also has a lot of humor. Um, she, gets a cat companion, uh, a feline familiar, and Mm -hmm. he can talk and he is so catty. Um, So a lot of people (laughs) really like him as a character. His name's Helios uh, because he is such, such the most adorable jerk. Like, and it is. Thank you. Um, (laughs) I think he forgot to mute. Oh, sorry. I miss. I mismuted myself. I had been muted, and I unmuted myself. Sorry. Oops. Uh, my parent. My par- apparently they decided that now was a good time to uh, replace a damaged internet wire from the storms a couple of weeks ago, uh, with with basically no warning. So hopefully things will be fine now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so who are some of the folklore figures that you will meet uh, throughout this game? Yeah, uh, the first folklore figure you meet is Sinbad um, because you take a ship to uh, Old Haven and uh, just like Sinbad's normal tales, he has a misadventure. (laughs) So uh, that's where you run into your first boss fight. Um, some of the other significant characters are Baba Yaga from Slavic lore, um, Sun Wukong and Tong Song Zen from Journey to the West. Uh, there is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and Prince Charming, um, as well as, uh, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting it. One of the legendary finder- firebirds, not the phoenix, the other one um, from Chinese lore. There's uh, the Tanuki and Kitsune from Japanese lore, and uh, many, many more. I could, I could keep going on. And then those uh, 56 collectible cards each have mm-hmm. a unique folklore character. Um, so there's, you know, 60, more than 60 different um, fairy tale and folklore characters in the game. Hmm. And um, I think you mentioned a while ago about, uh, something about recruitable NPCs, um, like, when you say recruitable, do you mean like they will follow you and like aid you in say combat or something like that? No, um, they are out in the world and when you meet them and fulfill their requests, um, they move to, uh, old Haven and then, uh, give you many quests, um, uh, at various intervals when you engage with them there. Uh, that's like, town recruiting or something like that you know like yeah um, definitely populates the town yeah um i suppose like is there any sort of romance system in the game 
Luna is 12, so there is no <laughs> romance system. She is, she is not yet yeah. ready to explore that. Yeah, well, that doesn't stop some people. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but she she is too busy learning to be a potions master. Um, though uh, <laughs> we're not talking about uh, external um things here, you know. Yeah, like we're talking internally here, which makes sense. Uh. Yeah, there does seem to be somebody that may have a crush on her. That that is, but that's not actually defined in the story. That's just has been theorized by some of our players. Right. One of the NPCs is very like kind to her and constantly gives her gifts. Yeah. People will infer those things, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, that, that, there's a difference between fan theory and you know you explicitly put in the game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Yeah. yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, so how long would you say an average person or, you know, let's say a seven-year-old girl will take to complete potions here? I would say an average adult gamer um, would take about 12 hours. I would say from how I've seen younger players, like, you know, eight eight years old, nine years old, ten years old um, play, it would probably take them about 24 25 hours and it's not because the you know the game is so much harder for them it's because they get really amazingly distracted by crafting and exploration um so and also I, this is probably maybe their first game they may not know how a controller works or mouse and keyboard works exactly yeah there, there's definitely a bit of a learning curve uh, the, the 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 game brands up I mean, despite starting with the boss fight, it, aside from that, it is pretty uh, considerate in its ramp up of mechanics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, as someone who knows how to beat the game, it's like knowing the answers to everything and the shortcuts to everything it would still take me at least six hours. So it's, it's not it's not a game you can rush too much. Maybe some speedrunners are going to prove me wrong. Um, yeah. but I, I wait for that. I was about to ask are crazy if- people. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, speedrunners will also um, manipulate the game in ways you didn't intend. Yeah, I can think of a few shortcuts, but because this is sort of story progression locked, um, there's only so much you can skip. <laughs> oh, and I know that's like one of the banes of speedrunners. I know. I yeah. also know <laughs> they're like the most famous last words of any dev when a speedrunner breaks the game. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I truly am. I've I've actually considered um, setting up a speed run and recording one myself, um, just to give people a goal. Because you know, obviously, I I know some pretty interesting ways to break my own game to sort of uh, to cheat no, a bit. <laughs> I mean, you have a head start. Yeah, yeah. At least one yeah, might I hope can. you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so, um, how to broach this? Um, anyway, I, you know, I remember when the game came out, um, what was it, uh, about a month ago, a month and a half? Yep, a month and a half ago. Yeah. Anyway, I, you know, I remember it coming out the same time as that EA Avalanche. Ugh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, like, you know, you gain some notoriety. Um, due to some well time completing. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was that's been a really interesting issue. Um, yeah, for for those who are not aware, um, I prepared very aggressively for um a successful launch of my title. Uh, it is generally uh a good estimate that you need about seven thousand, maybe ten thousand wish lists going into your launch day to get enough sales to end up on new and trending. I went in with 21 and a half thousand wish lists. So like two to three times the required amount. Uh, and there are ways, a uh, steam DB to look at the calendar of upcoming games, game launches, and then to be able to calculate how long you'll be on new and trending, uh, mm-hmm. being on the new and trending front page gives you about 2 million impressions, um, a few 
thousand sales and hundreds to thousands, or sorry, a few thousand wish lists and then hundreds to thousands of sales every day you're on there. And by my calculation, I should have been on Steam's uh, new and trending page for four days, uh, which would have by itself um, resulted in the the game uh, not causing me to be in debt. <laughs> um, uh, so I was very really hopeful for that. And also since this is a game about a young girl that's, you know, intended uh, to be supportive of, you know, a women audience made by a girl, I'd also decided to launch on International Women's Day. In my time zone, it was the day before, but, you know, Japan right. is like 16 hours, 18 hours ahead. Uh, so I, I chose that date intentionally. And then like two hours after I launched, EA Shadow dropped 11 titles, which oddly, like some of them were just in packs. Um, mm. Like the Command and Conquer series was in a pack of seven yeah. games, but it still listed, Steam still listed them all as individual titles. So they still took up seven slots on new and trending. Um, and since the new and trending list is actually uh date ordered unless you get like some absurd surge uh it immediately bumped me off the list and i was <laughs> i was really devastated because my sales uh were about 30 percent of what i predicted and you know like i said it wasn't so much the the monetary aspect of that it's just i worked on this project so long and i had you know these goals and I wanted to share it with a bunch of people and I just felt absolutely devastated because all of this planning went out the door um, from something completely unforeseen like there was no way for me to have predicted this because it wasn't listed anywhere Mm -hmm. so um, in being upset I I posted online a few places and I made a TikTok Uh, the TikTok I was like you know what sucks about being an indie developer you can work on for 10 years on a project and then you know EA can shadow drop 11 games and you know ruin all of your hard marketing but i also said happy international women's day at the end Uh, i said so happy international women's day um and uh that did not go over well with a particular (laughs) audience of yeah um, i can imagine (laughs) of people who maybe were already being grumpy because of their beliefs around sweet baby um so (laughs) that's one way to put it (laughs) (laughs) uh it was interesting watching that TikTok uh, gain in popularity um, because originally it was being pushed out to game developers and fans of cozy games and indie games. And everyone was really nice and supportive. And they're like, wow, that really sucks. I'm and so sorry. The that audience happened. shifted. <laughs> and then, yeah. So TikTok considers any engagement. Uh, engagement uh so when it got pushed to people who are like your game sex go kill yourself uh it's like wow these people really like engaging with this tiktok post we should show it to more of people like that um <laughs> so yeah. then that went so south um and actually i've i've had a hard time engaging the same way with social media because anytime i post anything um i get a bunch of kill yourself messages and yeah yeah. death threats and criticism, criticism. and um mm-hmm. it's it's been it's been a little exhausting i can imagine the uh mm-hmm. the sewer dwellers um will do what they usually do yeah i mean but like ultimately i have to recognize that all engagement has increased uh who it reached to. So people were telling me, they're like, Hey, my wife who doesn't play any video games at all, just saw your TikTok and showed me. Um, so marketing wise, I guess it did work out. Uh, it was never really intended to be for marketing. I mean, I was just sort of, Oh yeah. None of the stuff like, like when you post on TikTok, <laughs> like, Oh, this is totally a marketing stunt. No, no, it's not. I didn't mention the name of the game. Like it's not in the post. It's not in like what I said. I mean, technically like if you, screen paused where i was like showing the graph my game was there really blurry um yeah. but yeah if it was intended to be marketing i i did a very poor job of <laughs> if it was intended my to game. Be marketing, you'd be working marketing right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true that's true um yeah so that has been interesting um um dealing with the the outcome of that. I mean, I've gotten so much support and I've also gotten so much harassment. Um, so it's, it did recover sales. Sales are about 40% higher than what I predicted. Um, now. So, you know, ultimately I guess it's a win, 
But oh boy, like I was having, I was having some mental health uh, challenges initially because, like, <laughs> even though I know not to like listen to all this hate, it can get, just get really wearing. You know, just getting hundreds yeah. of messages, thousands, almost like six thousand comments telling me that I'm bad and whatever. Uh, that that right. can just be exhausting. I mean, how could it not? Yeah. Like, um, uh, I suppose um, I should ask: Has that um, vitriol died down any? Uh, oh, um, no. <laughs> slightly. Uh, so I started about four weeks, like maybe maybe two or three weeks ago. About four weeks after everything, um, I started posting just purely game development educational videos. Mm-hmm. Um, they have got, I have hate stalkers now. That's what I like to call them. I have hate stalkers. Uh, and so they just like, um, posting really toxic and mean things, uh, on all of my content, even things that are just like, Hey, if you want to be a game developer, here are some tips. They're like, you can't give tips. You are bad game developer. I'm like, you can, sure. Okay. (laughs) Let me see your game then. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you can't logic with them. I, I think they all probably need a hug and maybe some therapy. I, I uh, think and a, I'm sure I they have challenges in their life. Them, they burst into flames, though. <laughs> but maybe, I don't know. Like, I, I imagine that most people um, who are so toxic online do not act that way in person. One would um, hope, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I'm like... Past few years um, doesn't give me the cause to believe that. Yeah, I do think people have become less empathetic um, after COVID or through COVID. Mm. I I think that it has had a negative impact on society. So, yeah, very possibly. Like, um, anyway, so the game has been reasonably successful at this point. Yeah, um, we've we've sold about twelve thousand copies. And are there any plans to bring this to consoles? Yes, and I can't wait to do that. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing one more content patch update. I just released one on Saturday that added a new song with variations for each temple. That updated some art assets um, that needed to be like brought more to the style of current NPCs. Uh, and added some quality of life features and some bug fixes. I'm going to do one more content patch that's going to have more UI improvements, a few more art asset updates, um, and maybe some bug fixes. I don't know which bugs are still floating around. Uh, and then after that, I already have my dev kits, and I'll be starting on console development. Oh. Uh, so you'll be handling the uh, console development yourself? Yeah. I mean, my game's made in Unity, so it's pretty... Um, hopefully straightforward on that front. It's single player offline unity. Right. Um, so, and it already has controller support. So I just mm. need to get rebinding, which I hope to put in the next patch. Uh, and yeah, j- just do the, the console work. That makes sure it doesn't ex- blow up the consoles you're putting it on, you know, that stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it's such a small game, right? Like it's a, it's a 2d game. Like in terms of the entire game is 3.6 gigs. And I'm right. pretty sure a lot of that is music. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, like, yeah, the Nintendo Switch, I might have to do some optimization, but the optimization I'll probably have to do is like um, sound bank loading. Right now I load all my sound banks at once. Uh, and mm-hmm. I already have logic to do the sound bank loading. I just hadn't separated it on Wise, which is my audio engine um, to, to handle that. So I'm pretty confident in um, the the porting um uh, and you know obviously i have a lot of game development friends uh mm-hmm. who who have done porting so i will lean on them for their advice too <laughs> help mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the nice thing about the games industry everybody helps each other mm. that is handy um anyway so we are running out of time here yeah so uh, i will see um Galix, petty do you have any further questions here I think I'm good. Yeah, I think you've asked everything I was thinking of. All right. um, Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a a lovely discussion. 
Indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, it was uh, good having you. Um, certainly uh, loved hearing about the game. Um, anyway, um, the game is Potions, A Curious Tale. It is available now on Steam. Um, it is currently going for 15% off for $16.99. Um, regular price will be $19.99. And if you want to try before you buy, there is a demo available. So be sure to go and test it out today. Right. right. So that brings us to the end of another episode of Dragon Silicon. As usual, be sure to tune in next time for our Sunday reviews. And until then, I shall wish you good gaming.